Greetings and welcome to the Super Diamond Rain Show, episode 43, an interview with Lars Croyer, author of Investing Demystified. Um, I'm just going to do a brief financial disclaimer. Uh, we are not financial advisors. The content on this podcast and YouTube video are for educational purposes only and merely cite our own personal opinions. In order to make the best financial decision that suits your own needs, you must conduct your own research and seek the advice of a licensed financial advisor if necessary. Know that all investments involve some form of risk and there is no guarantee that you'll be successful in making, saving or investing money, nor is there any guarantee that you won't experience any loss when investing. Always remember to make smart decisions and do your own research. Okay, so about the guest today, uh, Lars Croyer is a Danish entrepreneur, author and former hedge fund manager. During his career, he worked for HBK Investments and Lazard Freres before co-founding a London-based hedge fund. Holt Capital was founded in 2002 and operated until 2008 when capital was returned to investors during the 2008 financial crisis. Croyer has released two financial books as an author. The first came in 2010 titled Money Mavericks, Confessions of a Head Fund Manager. The book studied the options available to investors, drawing the conclusion that many hedge funds fees were too high. Croyer released his second book in 2013, Investing Demystified. The book received positive reviews from both Money Week and, the Mor- and also the Morning Star. Um, and with that, welcome Lars to the show. It's an honor to have you on. Thanks for having me. I love your financial disclaimer, by the way. It's so true, isn't it? But no, no one ever actually says it or listens to it. But <laughs> you should take your own advice, and you should like definitely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, Lars, could you start by telling our listeners a little bit about you and your background? Um, sure. Um, so, I'm uh, originally Danish. Uh, well, I'm, I'm still Danish, I guess, but. Uh, uh, I I have lived in uh, outside Denmark since 1990. I went to school in the U.S. and joined Wall Street after out of out of university, and then went back to business school. And after business school, I joined a hedge fund, um, and that eventually led me to start my own hedge fund uh, in London. Uh, and since um, I did that from yes, as you said, 2002 to early 2008, so not before the financial crisis actually. Um, and since then, I've sat on, um, invested in, and sat on the board of, uh, of various hedge funds, um, and, and as you mentioned, written a couple of books about finance. Um, and I say that what we're talking about today is this whole idea that uh, it's really, really hard to beat the financial markets. It's very, you know, hard to claim to have an edge and know which stocks are going to do better or worse than the overall markets. And a lot of my work revolves around. Uh, Convincing people of that fact, having them embrace it, and then uh, help explain what they should do on the basis of that uh, premise. Great. Great. Um, I actually came across you uh, from a Bogleheads forum. Uh, it was a forum where the the guys were sort of recommending that you only needed two funds, um, you know, like a bond fund and a sort of like global equity, and um, just within the forum they sort of gave links to your YouTube videos. So that's kind of how I came across you. And then later on, I just bought your book, you know, Invest in Demystified. Um, so that's kind of how I came across it. But it just sort of was the right time for me to to look into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but before we sort of talk about your preferred investment strategy, uh, what are your thoughts on buying individual stocks and in people believing they have an edge over the market? Well, look, I mean, I'm, and this is important. I'm not saying edge doesn't exist. I'm saying that what you should do as an investor is you should start by saying, well, who are you? And so are you able to you know, outperform the thousands and thousands of professionals that have better access to information, technology, management, um, really anything you can imagine, probably have more suitable academic and, and uh, career background to make those picks. And... And if you can, so say, what does that mean? Well, that means you know better than the world whether Facebook and Google and whatever stock you pick uh, will outperform the market. I'm saying that that's extremely unlikely that you have that ability. Um, and I know a thing or two about that because I've operated in that space for many, many years. Um, and know even for all the people with the best access and 
best background to make those choices, how hard it still is to have an edge. Now I'm saying if you can come to embrace that you probably can't beat the market, what should you do then? And the answer to that is that you should buy the cheapest and broadest index tracker that you can get your hands on. And obviously make sure, and this is important, and make sure you do that in a tax optimized way. And what, and I can walk through how, how we get to that, but the way you end up is that you should buy a global tracker. So basically one, a product that um, invests in the global equity markets. So many, many thousands of underlying uh, stocks. And you should do that, and once you've done it in a tax optimized way, that is all you have to do for equity markets. That's what I'm saying. And we can then take a step further and some people say, well, why shouldn't I just give my money to one of these many professional investors that we see the billboards of the fidelities of the world? Um, and the answer to that question is you shouldn't because despite what they all say in the ads, um, you, about one, call it 10 to 15 percent of mutual funds outperform the markets that they operate in over a 10 year period. So stop and just take a minute to say, well, what does that mean? That means that, call it one out of 10 funds does better than the index tracker that you can just go and pay 0.1% for in, in yearly fees. Just one out of 10 does better than that index tracker over a 10 year period. And can you really tell which one that's gonna be ahead of time? The overwhelming likelihood is you can't. Actually, if you can, get in touch, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> but, but it's, you know, that's, so that's, that's comes back to them. We can talk about other asset classes and equities, but that's a, that's a, that's a, um, that's sort of the overriding theme of a lot of stuff I talk about. Okay. So your strategy is not particularly complex, uh, which drew me to it. Um, in fact, it is very simple and low cost. It generally involves two, possibly three funds. If you wanted to add corporate bonds as well as government bonds, uh, can investing really be this simple and easy? Well, yeah, I mean, it can. I mean, I, absolutely. Um, not only can it, but I think for most people it should be. Now, when, when I say two funds, again, you know, okay, so take equity markets, global equity, uh, global equities, and you can buy it through Vanguard, you know, BlackRock, a number of providers. Um, the reason I tend to not, by the way, recommend a provider is because they come out with new products all the time. Sometimes they lower their fees. Sometimes taxes are important. So each investor's individual situation. Now, so that's one investment, right? Your global equity trackers. But what if your risk profile, the, the profile that you should think about given your individual situation, what if that is such that you shouldn't only invest in something as high risk as equity markets can be? Well, in that case, you can, you can take... The other extreme, and you can say, well, uh, you know, you're based in the UK. You can actually have available to you an investment that is virtually risk-free. Now, there's no such thing in the world as a risk-free investment, but very low risk-free, namely government bonds for the time horizon that matches your investment profile. So let's say you have a 10-year horizon. You can pick government bonds that have 10-year maturity. You invest in those, and that's basically no risk or very, very little risk or as little risk as you can get. And you can then combine that with an investment in the global equity markets. And you combine those two in the proportions that suit your risk profile. So let's say for some investors, that's 50, 50, so for some it's 90, 10, for some it's 100% of one and, and none of the other. And the answer is if you don't want to take any risk, buy all government bonds. If you want to take a lot of risk, you can buy, buy the equity markets. So now you have a portfolio with two products that is actually tailored to your needs. And again, remember tax, that's obvious. And that, that is one of the many places where an advisor can be helpful. Um, but you've created a very, very robust portfolio and you have two products. And if you add complexity to that, all the stuff they sell you in the banks or private equity or real estate, you can do that, but you introduce a lot of complexity and, and I don't think necessarily a lot of value unless you can you claim to have this amazing and magical ability to somehow outperform. So that, yes, it can be that simple. Um, Lars, I noticed that a lot of um, default occupational pensions have a heavy lean into the UK, for example, as well as the Vanguard's life strategy range. 
Um, currency risk is another thing to look out for, which leads to a lot of individual investors being heavy in their home market. Uh, what's your opinion on having a home bias? I think it's I think it's a mistake um, for two reasons, really. Um, first of all, this, it's it's often based on tradition. Right? When I you know in the, in the old days, and now I'm talking even 20, 30 years ago, it was actually very very costly to invest abroad. And if you go further back than that, there were transactional issues, tax issues, and so forth. And I think a lot of that is sort of stuck around. And if you add to that the fact that a lot of active managers tend to feel that you know when they pick stocks they pick stocks in the in the, the 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 markets that they know and have sort of been brought up with and that in itself create creates a home bias you don't have to have that anymore the second fact is if you think about your investment portfolio not just as the money you're investing but your overall life there's a very large likelihood that you have tons of assets on top of. In fact, most people have assets on top of their investment assets, right? Your, your home, your education, your future earnings prospects. So let's say you're based in, in London, well, and you own a flat there. Well, you already long the London property market. You probably have a job. You already long the London economy. Um, your future, let's say you're educated in London, so if that's somehow tied to the London economy, you're plenty long the UK economy. And if anything, you should therefore not be long the UK economy with your investment portfolio. In fact, you should deselect it. And we can talk about how that's possible, but, but at least you shouldn't add to that concentration because you're already long a bunch of stuff that means that if the London economy does well, you're going to be fine. But it also means that if the London economy does poorly, don't at least have your investment assets somewhat be a diversification tool, which a global tracker is, is as diverse as it possibly can be. Of course, that doesn't mean that the world isn't correlated to the London economy. In fact, it often will be. But at least you're not deliberately adding to that concentration. So no, do not do, uh, don't add to the home bias. If I can just, as an aside, and I know I'm rambling on here. This is why it really bugs <laughs> when, you know, someone buys a flat and then they go and, and that's perfectly fine. And I, you know, you know, I, I know why, I can appreciate why people want to do that. But then they take their last penny and they go down the road and they borrow a bunch of money and they buy another flat. Maybe they have some sort of an angle why that's a great investment, but they're really adding a lot of concentration to that street. Definitely. You know? <laughs> and, and they better hope that that street does really well in life. Right? <laughs> they're really crossing their fingers, but what if it doesn't? And, and there's a huge recency bias in our investing where, you know, oh, London property market has done so well, it'll probably continue to do well. There's no statistical or historical evidence for anything like that. And go ask the people in Las Vegas or Miami how that worked out for them during the financial crisis. Right? There are more yeah. personally bankrupt people there than anywhere. That's right, so yeah. be aware of home buyers and concentration issues. Um, the, would you mind telling us a, a bit more about the volatility reducer, or as I refer to them, the brakes of the fast <laughs> car? Uh, this would be the, the fixed income side of the portfolio, the bonds. Yeah. Um, the importance of maybe having them and why why they're they're crucial to the portfolio. Yeah, so look, they they are crucial for as you as a, I like your analogy the the brakes on the car. They, <laughs> you know, let's start by asking. Let's say you have you have you know um, perhaps a terrible example, but you have a hundred pounds, and next year you need ninety five pounds for heart surgery. You know, you know you should not put your money in equity markets, right? Because yeah, you know, they can go anywhere. Now, over time, they're probably going to go up far more than the bonds. That's, you know, we can talk about why that's a reasonable expectation. But so you want to have something that potentially is as low risk as it can be. Now, cash in the bank is obviously a very decent alternative, which, by the way, is insured by the government up to a certain point, depending on the jurisdiction. But this government bond in the time horizon, the, the heart surgery was a terrible example, but the heart <laughs> surgery example I just gave you was a, a one year horizon. You can think of that as what is the lowest risk place I can put my money for the next year. You're based in the UK, government bonds are the lowest risk. You can say, well, why not US Treasuries? True, very low risk in its own right, 
but it's U.S. dollars. So what happened if the, the, the sterling dollar FX rate uh, varies dramatically over the next year? You're, you're taking a risk that you're not getting compensated for by commensurate higher expected returns. Because in real terms, the dollar and sterling government bond rates are very, very similar. So that's what I'm saying. That it is that risk. Now take that and maybe I should find another analogy. But what was you need a 95 for, for open heart surgery. Now you have five that you can take risk with. Let's so maybe put those five in the equity markets because you can afford that to go wrong. Yeah. Right? And so it, that's your break. In this case, 95 fives, <laughs> which is pretty conservative. But, you know, yeah. hey, you know, for someone, you know, if my kids were investing their savings, which I wish they would, by the way, <laughs> Stupid money, but then they could afford a very, very different um, risk tolerance because they they don't need the money right now. They're saving for the long term. Um, what are your thoughts? Because I know you talk about it in your book, uh, Investing Demystified, about adding corporate bonds to the mix. Um, I've heard that having say sixty percent government bonds to say forty percent corporate bonds can be a good blend. Um, also, heard corporate bo bonds can behave like stocks in a crash. So would you not be better off, say, increasing the global equities to take a bit more risk or just hold less government bonds? Or do you think that, you know, obviously having corporate bonds is a good good thing to add? Mm -hmm. to well, yeah, so, so, so a couple of points there. Um, generally, I'm all for simplicity, right? because once you introduce complexity, it brings a lot of byproducts like expensive advice, tax consequences. What are you really having exposure to and so forth? For example, when you say corporate bonds, there's an even greater tendency to have it be in your home jurisdiction. Right? So if you own corporate bonds, even I, I suspect they're British. Right? I, you know, I don't know, but that wouldn't be a horrible suggestion. Now, so it's very hard to create or have global exposure to corporate bonds. It's so actually gaining the exposure and making sure that, that, it's, that it's a good exposure. It's not as simple as it seems. Similarly with non home country government bonds. So they're actually, I don't think, bad products to add. And, and, and you know, if you could, by all means, think about tax, think about, you know, uh, concentration. But, you know, if you can deal with those things, I think it's a good thing. Do you have to to make a robust portfolio? No. Right? You can indeed gain a lot of the same exposures that, that you would in, uh, in in the global equity markets. And you're right, the riskier the, gov the, the, the corporate bonds, the more they look like equities. I mean, some, <laughs> you know, some corporate bonds are so cheap that relative to the, 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 the par value that, you know, they're really, you know, that they can, they can, they can look a lot like equities. So, so is it a good thing to add the, the, the corporate bonds and other government bonds? Sure. Um, if you, are not afraid of a little complexity. Do you have to? Um, no, you don't have to. You mentioned in your book, Invest in Demystified, and, and your YouTube videos about the lowest risk asset available. Um, mm. What would you describe that as? And if you believe such a thing exists in today's market? Um, well, so it depends, right? What is the lowest risk? The example before I mentioned, you know, I should stop saying the heart. I'm going to have a heart attack. If I keep it. <laughs> But, right. but like, who who are you? What currency do you need the money in? And if it's if it's UK, um, it's a, a UK government bond. If you're in Berlin, you have, you know, a, a German government bonds. If you're in New York, you have US government bonds. Those are all very low risk, very good alternatives, and incredibly deep and liquid markets. We can talk how you practically buy it. Now, my yeah, you know, my best mate is Bolivian, <laughs> and you know, what if he was back in Bolivia, right? And and he and and he was asked the same question, or his parents lived there, right? What, what about their savings? And the answer is they don't really have it. Right? They can buy U.S. government bonds, U.K. whatever. Um, actually, if they have access, but um, but then they introduce currency risk, right? Or they can buy local government bonds, but then they introduce credit risk. So it really does depend on 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 who you are. Um, and I'm saying if you're lucky enough to have your savings and investments in a currency where there is a, a, a suitable low risk alternative, yes, that is the answer. If you're not, you have the choice between uh, local government bonds or foreign government bonds where you're introducing uh, currency risk. So of course, again, there are issues such as cash in the bank, 
Um, but again, that depends on the credit quality of the local banks and, and indeed the government guarantees and how much is that guarantee. But that's that's what it is. And it's I think for, for the vast majority of investors, they have their investments in in dollars, euros or sterling or you know, there are other currencies, obviously. And for them, they are very decent uh, local currency alternatives. Uh, do you have a personal preference um, on using, say, index funds versus, say, ETFs, which have grown in a lot of popularity of yeah. late? Well, look, it's, I, I think you got to go back to what are you trying to do? Right? You're trying to have the broadest, cheapest, tax-efficient exposure. And let's just assume we talk equity markets here. Now, is that an ETF? For a lot of people, the answer would be yes, it is, because they are now so cheap, they trade like a stock. So basically, if you have a, a, an account where you can keep a stock, you can own an ETF and you're done, right? Um, it used to be index funds. Uh, you know, we talk about the dynamics of that. For me, it's not so much which it is, it's what is the underlying exposure. And it should be, again, the broadest, cheapest you can find. And then, you know, what is uh, the most tax efficient depends on your situation. There are obviously also issues around liquidity, but generally when you're talking these kind of products, you're talking the whole world, so it's pretty liquid. Right? <laughs> yeah. And um, but but again, you obviously got to care about liquidity. So I I don't I wouldn't say I don't care because I you know but 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 don't forget that the important bit is the exposure. Um, mm -hmm. And this is one of these areas like I've been accused of being the guy who sort of says, oh, you don't ever need to talk to financial advisors. I don't think that's true at all. Um, this is one of those areas where it probably is a good thing to have, have someone from the industry or someone from, from the financial advisory side of things to help you out with your not only risk, but also what is actually the best access product for you. Definitely. It's always good to get like a second opinion as well, sort of. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and I think, I think a lot of times the, you know, that, that, industry has changed a lot and it should because it used to be that you know the big I to some extent still right it used to be that the big banks would rip you off because they would you'd go to them and they would say oh you got to buy our product you know our magic product where you can never lose money and then they would find all sorts of clever ways to, to, to rip you off now you essentially should pay next to nothing for for these advisory products and keep in mind also when you go and talk to an advisor if you say to them, look, I already know what I want to buy. I want to buy a global equity tracker. Then it's like, well, no one can charge you a lot for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know you don't have to get advice on which magical outperforming fund to buy. So, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to rip you off. You know? <laughs> um, here in the UK, we have tax sheltered vehicles like pensions and stocks and I, stocks and shares ISAs. Uh, do you have any suggestions where best to hold certain assets? You often hear about asset allocation. This question refers to asset location. So, for example, you may choose to hold global equities mainly in your ISA and then mostly fixed income government bonds in your pension. Any mm. thoughts on this? Obviously, you mentioned it's very important to think about taxes as it can really derail your plans. Mm. Yeah, look, it, it's, it's a funny thing that we talk about taxes, right? And, and yet we say very little about it. <laughs> but I'd rather you invest in a tax-optimized active fund than a horrible tax <laughs> position index tracker, right? Because, you know, that, can, that, that could ruin everything, right? So get that right. Um, whether you should have assets in your eyes or, or elsewhere, well, you should obviously look at your overall financial life. And you should also look at when does this money become available to you? What is actually liquid right now? And do you need that liquidity right now? And, um, and you know, are there other assets that you can only get on retirement? So you got to think a little bit about, about that. You know, let's say you had half your assets in a, in, in, in a, in a pension you can't touch until retirement. The other half, you know, you have available to you right now in a, in a deposit account somewhere. Well, Maybe you shouldn't have the riskiest assets, the stuff you need right now, because you know who knows where that where that goes, yeah, right? So you point. still may may want the long term earnings potential of the equity market, so you put that in the in 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 the pot that that you don't need in the next while. 
Yeah, again, if you're uncertain about that, these are the things that really matter to your personal circumstances. Or when I say personal, by the way, I mean who are you? Right. So that could actually be an institution. Um, but um, but again, that's probably an area where you know, your disclaimer made sense, right? Just kind of <laughs> do think about it. Do take some advice. Do read, and 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 there are you know typically better answers if you think about it. Um, the next question is kind of similar that I want to ask, but just to sort of get your opinion on it. Um, each individual has different risk tolerances, ages, situations and incomes. Uh, would you recommend seeking help from a financial advisor to determine their risk levels to figure out their asset allocation? Obviously, there is many rules of thumb out there like your age minus 100 equals your bond portion or the 120 or 110 rule. Mm. Um, do you have any sort of take on that in terms of? Yeah, look, I think rules of thumb are exactly that, right? You know, what if you're Bill Gates, right? You know, <laughs> I'm sure Bill Gates has lots of advice if he wanted it, but, you know, he can afford a lot of risk, right, before he's in trouble and the, the age minus, I don't know how old he is, but his age minus, <laughs> was minus his age was his bond portfolio. Yeah. So, you know, for an average investor in an average circumstance, I think those things can probably be better than average advice but you know there are a lot of a lot of uh, other factors and you do have to look at your overall life right you know are you you know some people have i mean the funny thing about being an author and i did these youtube videos originally because my publisher asked me to but a lot of people get in touch and they only get in touch about their investments very often right? but then sometimes they have these other assets or very, very wealthy in a massive house with no mortgage, right? Yeah. Or sometimes they're hugely geared somewhere else. And that does matter. So like, you can't just say, oh, Lars, what should I do with my investment portfolio? There's this whole other thing, right? Or you're <laughs> someone who is not going to make a lot of money because they are you know, a teacher. Or someone who works and is, has, has huge prospects for making a ton of, ton of cash going forward. It does make a difference who you are. And again, if you're unsure, you know, read about it and think about it, but also perhaps get some advice. Definitely. Um, I'm sorry, that's a very vague answer. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, it's not an easy, easy one. Um, I note from a previous podcast you were on called Informed Choice Radio, you said you really only buy what you what fund you need at the time and to take time to assess your allocation if you feel it needs changing or updating according to your where you are in life financially, uh, making emotional or behavioral mistakes within investing is quite common, particularly for beginners. Obviously, you can make this low cost approach to invest in unnecessarily ex expensive and defeat uh, its purpose and simplicity. What is your take on charges uh, for dealing fees within platforms and mistakes individual investors make by over trading with their investments, say possibly even changing funds a lot? or even yeah. trying to time the market? Yeah, don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't. Look, okay, so something happens a lot, particularly, actually, I think it might even happen more with individual stocks, right? You own a stock, let's say you own Facebook, and it's trading at $100, and you just love it. You think it's the best thing. And now it goes to 50, so it must be twice as good. Right? There's a huge tendency to be like, oh, I know something, I see something, or... The markets have dropped so much that you know, it can't go any lower, so I should double down. Or even the market has, you know, um, it's dropped so much that I can't afford it to drop any further. Now, that is absurdly, it seems, on, on, on initial plans, perhaps reasonable. Because right? it is possible that as circumstances change, your risk preference changes. Right? So I love the view that perhaps, you know, equity markets are risky, obviously. And uh, they perhaps you can reasonably expect them to go up four or five percent um, after inflation per year. Now that's based on hundreds of years of, of, of historical returns in all sorts of environments and geographies and circumstances. And if you use that as a very very rough rule of thumb for the future, that's perhaps not crazy. Now, does that mean that because something happens in the markets, the markets go up a lot or down a lot, or does that mean that you can all of a sudden see which way markets are going to go. No, you can't. But it doesn't mean that your risk preferences don't change, right, up or down. So that's possible. 
But what a lot of people do is, and uh, you know, they trade a lot, and it's expensive. It's not just the the commissions, but they're also often tax consequence, bid offer spreads, market impacts, and so forth. Um, and 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 it's very often a mistake, unless it is because your position changed, either because of something external to your investments or because of what happened in the market. Like if you lose your job, you probably you're in a different financial situation than if you didn't lose your job, right? If markets drop 50%, it's not impossible that you're in a different position from if they didn't drop 50%. But don't trade because you all of a sudden think you know something that you didn't know before. Right? That, that, that's, I think, a mistake a lot of people make. Um, so you're currently living in in my old hometown, London, where obviously house prices are really scary, um, or really crazy. Um, even renting can be extremely expensive, depending on the area and type of place that you choose. Um, I personally like the freedom renting gives, but will admit sometimes purchasing property can make sense when you make the right calculations. Um, what is your opinion on property investing? Um well, it's it's one of the many things that I have consistently gotten wrong. So <laughs> I remember I lived in Notting Hill, it was a very smart part of London for um, actually for ten years, and I always thought I always didn't buy because it couldn't be this expensive. <laughs> and kept it up and up. So I'm one of those guys. Look, I think a lot of people are massively overexposed to to real estate through um, their their primary residence. That's just. You know, for most people, that's the biggest purchase of their lives. And now, you know, I own a home in London, as you say, and, and, and you know, for my optimal financial situation, that may not make sense, but it's my home, right? It's where my kids grow up. And, and I think to a certain extent, that is what it is. Now, you know, again, don't, also don't forget that when we buy a global equity tracker, what is it you buy? You're buying a lot of, you know, Facebook, you're buying, you know, all these companies you know, you're also buying a lot of companies you don't know in a lot of geographies. You actually indirectly have a ton of exposure to real estate markets. Yeah, absolutely. I just think you own a bunch of banks that, that <laughs> issue markets. Yeah, you know, you're yeah. plenty exposed to real estate. Right? So you don't have to go get real estate unless you somehow think you can outperform the local markets. I don't really have a view whether whether real estate is going to go up or down in any particular market. I, said, well, I, might, I might once in a while say, oh, that sounds, that looks really cool. And <laughs> but I certainly don't have any kind of angle or edge to say that about London or anywhere else. Um, so, you know, if you do, good luck to you. Right. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I, I don't now in terms of renting versus buying. Yeah. I think from like an optimal perspective, perhaps renting is not a bad idea, but again, you're getting into quality of life issues and, yeah, you know, a lot of people feel that owning owning where they live is really important to them, and say by all means, you know, if it's ninety nine point nine nine percent of your assets, then maybe reconsider. But <laughs> you know, I think yeah. there's a point where we have to live our lives and be happy, right? True. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. Absolutely, yeah, true. Um, yeah, just sort of as an alternative um, to obviously uh, stocks and bonds, um, I was just curious to hear your opinion on investing in gold. Uh, be it owning it physically or through through an e ETF, just wanted to get your your opinion on it. Yeah, I think look. Um, so I'm not a fan. I mean, I, and I uh, certainly I've actually sort of to some extent studied the history of gold. It's, it's really <laughs> interesting. I'd encourage anyone to have a look. But you know, so is gold the perfect hedge? No. You yeah, know, it's it's it it is in some countries traditionally because you didn't trust the banks and you didn't trust the governments and what on earth are you going to do with your money um, and that has led to a whole industry of trying to answer that question but if you holding gold it's, it's a hedge against what like a small decline in the market is it a hedge against complete collapse of the world as we know it you know what is it exactly you're trying to accomplish if it's let's say let's say you were back in march 2009 and from there, we can all agree the world became a better place, right? at least financially. Now, what if it from there had collapsed? What if from that point had gotten 10 times worse? Right? You're talking banks collapsing, governments breaking down, no food in the shelves as Tesco, et cetera, et cetera. Would you want to own a gold ETF? I mean, that does assume functioning markets. Right? <laughs> so, okay, so maybe not. Right? Would you want to have gold in your house? Well, 
puts a big mark on your back, doesn't it? At least <laughs> people know it. And what are you going to go transact it somewhere? Are you going to go down on the quarter with a gold bar and say, can I have <laughs> some food? Or I don't know. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we hear the horrible stories about war and famine where that's what people did. But it, you know, so just understand why you're doing it from a pure financial perspective. It hasn't been a great investment. Is there something to indicate that it that it that it will be in the future? I, not that I know of. There are probably other assets. Maybe you can look at some of the some of the, the the crypto assets, the blockchain technologies, maybe a store in absolute emergencies. But you know, I think by and large, if you assume that the world doesn't completely collapse, um, you know, yeah, the, your local government bonds are perhaps not a terrible alternative if you're okay with exchange rate risk and you're really worried about this. You can you can you can diversify. By, uh, uh, across a couple of them, and also don't keep in mind keep in mind that global equity tracker is very risky, but it is also thousands of underlying securities across industries and geographies, so you are pretty diversified. Right? You know, yeah. it's, it's not one stock at the local at the local uh, <laughs> town. Yeah. Right? So, so yeah, so so no. The short answer to 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 gold is you know why you're doing it, and then it's not necessarily expected to be a great financial investment or indeed hedge sure um so you touched a little bit on cryptocurrency uh mm. things like bitcoin as well um mm. i went to a recent financial meetup and there was quite a few people that were really into it mm. uh, personally i just don't like the um you know the fact that it's not safe or guaranteed you know there's a lot of risk involved in owning it you know mm. you could lose your wallet password or you could have it stolen um it just doesn't feel very trustworthy to me and and it's obviously volatile as well so you know maybe similar to gold and maybe property to a degree um do you have any opinion on it so. it's far more volatile. yeah far more exactly you're never gonna hear me tell someone to well, never say never but no <laughs> yes some your money can disappear in an instant you, you know it is very volatile um you know, I, I absolutely, it's still a very, very small fraction of the value of, of global assets. So if you ignore it, it's fine. I personally think the technology behind it is super, super interesting. And it's going to um, grow like mad. This doesn't mean that you should own cryptocurrencies as an asset class. But, you know, in terms of disintermediating banking and efficiency of, 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 of transactions, absolutely, that's, that's going to be a thing. But that's that's slightly different, different. from what yeah. investing. Um, so yeah. no, I don't. I don't. If you just ignore that and pretend it doesn't exist, I, I who knows? It can obviously go up in value, but <laughs> I, I don't think from a like I can't beat the markets perspective. It's something you should worry too much about missing out on. I think that you know the sort of two fund method that you use is is great because obviously, as you say, it's globally diversified. Uh, it covers many sectors. Um, it's you know the bond elements really good as well. So to me, that's that's how I invest, and I, I, feel, I you know I think it's a good way, good way forward, and you know very, uh, very good way to go about it. To be honest, because as you say, there's so many ways that you can add things in to make things more complicated that you you don't need. So it's, I yeah. think it's um, you know the best one for me. <laughs> so it's 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 um, one of my. It was a big moment when I got my mom to do it this way. And it was because my mom has always been like, oh, I, this stock is going to do so well. And, I, and she had thought she had an angle, so she had a son <laughs> who was a London-based hedge fund manager. <laughs> so that was terrible. But once she started doing index investing, what's actually been uh, one of the best things is just time. Like, you just don't have to spend a ton of time trying to figure out if, you know, this company is going to do better than that company or the risk profile. You don't, you just, you know, you sort of put the money in the most efficient way you can in, in equity markets. And then you obviously have to think about your risk. And once in a while, you have to reassess your financial situation. But you don't have to, you don't have to buy the FT anymore. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you don't have to spend much time on it. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's actually, and also keep in mind when you are actively investing, you're, you all the time, and forget about cost for a second. All the time you put in, the only 
thing you're getting paid for is the excess returns. So let's say markets go up 8% and you go up 10. It's only the two because you didn't have to do anything to get the eight. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so, and over time, I'm saying in all likelihood, the two is going to be negative, particularly because we always only remember our winners. But if we really audited everything we'd ever done for a lot of people, it really would be negative. It's another reason to go index investing. So the, the, the time element and cost element, it's just unless you really think you can beat the market or know someone that can, either way, get in touch. Then just <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so Lars, where would be the best place for my listeners to check out more about more about your work and to find you on the on the internet? Um, I don't know if you can spell my surname, you can Google me. So I've done some YouTube videos. Um, obviously, I have my books. I generally think you know, uh, Monovator dot com is a good site. Sure, um, yeah, very good one. Uh, yeah. yeah, but but if you go, I also have a website. But it's yeah, I hate to say. Blow my own horn, but if you check out the videos, it's a good place to start. You can buy my books if you if you if you want. Um, but but uh, yeah, generally it is a pretty simple message, um, and and I kind of like to keep it that way. <laughs> so, <laughs> but no, I don't. I don't. Uh, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't. I don't uh, do anything like that. Um, sure. Actually, it's interesting. For the first time ever, I've sort of thought whether I should do a little bit like that. But it's it's a tough it's a tough business. So, yeah, absolutely. And also yeah. because if you are essentially telling people like, don't pay a lot, well, you know, <laughs> you just have to live too, right? So, yeah. so we are adding a cost element, and and I think, yeah, you don't necessarily want cheap advice either. Yeah, right? so exactly. <laughs> you do it for eight pounds an hour. That may not be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, thanks again, Lars, for coming on the show. Really enjoyed uh, having you on. And um, just for our listeners, uh, please follow us on Twitter at Super Diamond Ra or Super Diamond RA. And please leave a review on iTunes. And also, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, and thank you very much. And uh, peace out. <laughs>